Welcome back to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Jason Rugg, joined as always by Christian Taylor. Hello, Jason. And we're joined again by Ken Burns. Glad to have you here. Great to be here. Thank you. And uh, this is part two of our interview. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode, go listen to that one first. You'll get Ken Burns' bio. You should probably already know who he is. But (laughs) we're just so excited to continue. What's wrong with you? (laughs) We're so excited to continue this conversation. So we're just going to jump right into it. Christian? Yeah. I want to follow up where we left off. In the last episode, you had gone through sort of the whole story of the American Buffalo and, you know, explain to us why there's so much more to the story than than we would have previously thought. Uh, so if you're interested in the summary of the American Buffalo, please go back and listen to episode one. One of the things where we left off was talking about the people that are involved in the film. And I want to start first uh, with some very special partners uh, who I think are retiring uh, after okay. this uh, series. Well, it just is such a bittersweet moment, I think, because I did watch and I want to tell people about this. You have a new um, work called Unum, I think, and it's on your website, KenBurns.com. Uh, it's brilliant because I think you're taking your long works and repackaging them for a 2023 audience where people need shorter content, but also you're tagging everything so well so that people can find it. And you can see how, how all your work intersects. And so I did watch this interview with you and Dayton, I think, and Julie, yeah. uh, And it was such a beautiful interview. It's only half an hour. I recommend everybody watch it. I was overcome with Dayton's emotional, uh, emotionalness about basically saying this was his swan song and about all the work that you've done and not just with you, but also with the stories. And so I want you to talk a little bit about this team, because I think as filmmakers, we want to understand how do you cultivate a team like that? And when you do, um, I mean, the sky's the limit. So talk about it, those. It things. is the sky's the limit. You know, the, I, I think that um, my brother once said that all art forms, you know, when they die and go to heaven, uh, want to become music, which is the mm. only art form that's invisible and that we want, you know, we want to become music. And I think what a, an analogy is, is that, you know, in a way I'm a conductor of a group of people. And in fact, I have three or four by different counting teams that I'm working with. And one of them has been for the last dozen years or so, Dayton Duncan, who I've worked with for uh, more than 30 years. And Julie Dunphy, if you don't count her 16 year maternity leave, I've worked for for even longer, worked with for even longer. And um, Julie's a producer, Dayton's a writer and producer, and we've done a lot of things like the West. And Julie and I made a film on Thomas Hart Benton, the regionalist painter and uh, they were advisors on the Civil War, and we made uh, Dayton and I made the uh, Lewis and Clark and Horatio's Drive and the National Parks, and then Julie and Dayton and I made the Dust Bowl and country music, and now this. And they're both retiring. Dayton had retired from producing before Benjamin Franklin, and Julie did that for for the Buffalo, and then is retiring after that. Um, Dayton wrote a beautiful script and, you know, in the beginning is the word. And so we really value our writers, including Jeffrey Ward, um, my longest collaborator. And, um, and now more recently, Sarah Burns and David McMahon, who are doing writing on, on other films like Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali and, and new things that we're working on, but it's a whole team. I mean, there's probably hundreds of credit people listed in the credits, rightfully so, in something like country music or Vietnam War, in which the team there was the Jeffrey Ward, the writer, and Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein, uh, co-directors. Um, but it's really handmade by about 18 people, you know, 15, yeah. 18, depending on how long it is. And there, you know, people say, oh, you must have so many researchers. And we go, no, just, you know, it's us, you know, a handful of people, associate producers um, who, who are there. And there's an intimacy to the editing se- se- situation with an editor and a, an apprentice and an intern and a assistant, you know, it's, it's very, very hands-on and people do lots of different work. And, and we also have a model, which is, I think slightly different, which is we never stop researching and we never stop Mm -hmm. writing. We're not a fixed time to research, a fixed time to write out of which is a produced a script that informs the shooting. Well, you're always in pre-production. You're always in research and pre-production. We're always shooting too. We shoot right away. And so we're shooting things both archivally, 
um, as well as live and interviews without knowing where they're going to go. Anytime you see a talking head in our film, it's just a happy accident. We haven't <laughs> asked somebody to get us from paragraph two to paragraph mm -hmm. three on page four of episode seven. We've never done that, right? Um, so you can pick any film, go to any place, and whenever you see that thing, that's just a happy accident. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're asking somebody about the Battle of Gettysburg, you're going to presume that their comment, if it survives, will be in the section on the Battle of Gettysburg, but not necessarily. And there are places I could show you something in jazz that Wynton Marsalis says that you knew he had heard the quote that um, came before him. I did not learn that quote until a year after the interview. And that inter that little bite had migrated to three or four different places where I said, let's put it after the Nick LaRocca quote. But I couldn't tell you, nobody <laughs> would believe me in a million years if at near the very end of episode one of jazz that you didn't hear Nick LaRocca, a New Orleans musician, um, who said that black people had nothing to do with the invention of jazz. And then Winton's response, you were certain you'd heard. And it's ironically, the quote was read by Harry Connick Jr., who's a dear friend oh, of wow. Wynton, even though it's a racist quote. Um, anyway, it's that's sort of the, the way we run. And we have really long attenuated editing. And we also record our music first. So the music informs the pace and rhythm of the editing, not something you add on like icing to Fascinating. amplify emotions you hope you hope are there. This attenuates editing, but it, it makes it more organic. And so people remember the music in the film. And why Can I stop that? you right there? Because that I really want to dig into that because we actually did something like that, but I thought we did it wrong because I didn't want to fall <laughs> in love with temp. I didn't want to have this temp love of something uh, to edit to and then be dissatisfied with the music that we went with. So we did work with our composer to kind of uh, compose as we go along, but it sounds yeah. like you're saying you did all of that before. And then well, how would you I'll know take, I'll take uh, an example of the Civil War series in which all every song but one is from the Civil War period. The most famous song from that period is Ashokan Farewell, which is the most beautiful Scotch-Irish lament that was written by a Jewish um, member of the session musicians that we worked with named Jay Unger. Uh, which he wrote in like 15 minutes. And it's just beautiful. It, 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 it sort of bridges the gap between. I remember and it. And it's, it's what people play it. I mean, today it's being played at, at weddings and funerals and memorial services and renewal of vows a thousand times today across mm -hmm. America. But what I did is I went into old hymnals and I identified hymns from the period and had them, somebody play it out on the piano and go pick four or five. And then I go into songbooks of the period and pick some popular music, took the martial music of the period and uh -huh. the anthems. And then I would have bring in the musicians and they'd play each one of those tunes 10 times, maybe 15 different ways. 20 huh. different ways. Uh, and, and that created what we call musical beds that we'd use at any time. And we would rather wow. edit our words to fit the musical phrase or expand our words to fit the musical phrase than we are to then just wait till we're done, lock the picture, and then bring in somebody who is there to amplify emotions you hope, you hope, you hope are there wow. and, and score it, which is a mathematical term, right? We'd rather have the integrity of the music be the, the, the most important thing. So that's you know, fascinating. How did it, you come up with that idea? <laughs> it just seems so logical to me that music wasn't an afterthought. It's not huh. like the thing when the, but when you're out of money that you then decide, what do we do for music? I've just been using these temp drops. I mean, in Vietnam, we had 126 pieces of music. Um, that were and you did all of those before. How did you decide? Well, we did in that case, because it was found music needle drops. We just realized we were going to have that. So we, we went first to the Beatles and said, we need your help. And they said, fine, we love your work. And, um, <laughs> they gave us, it was still very expensive on most favored nations. And then we could go back down to everybody else say, well, the Beatles and they go the Beatles. And so all of a sudden we were able to do that. It was still millions of dollars in rights, but we were able to put in revolution where it should go. We were able to put in, let it be where it should go. Amazing. We were able to put in Blackbird where it should go. We were able to put in four or five Dylan pieces and Stones pieces and all of that. In addition to the fact that, uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross were also working on specific 
things for our soundtrack, uh, beds, and we would show them just raw interviews and raw footage. And then they come back and then that would animate a scene. I mean, it was, that's, that's, I, I, I mean, I, 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 however anybody does it, I've, I've watched Steven Spielberg and John Williams in the studio with 500 musicians after they've locked the picture, you know, making sure that that hit is right on that frame. Right. And that's fine too. We know how great a composer John Williams is, and I'm sure stuff gets worked into his early on in the process. But, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. If you see a horror film and, and turn down the volume, just turn down the volume. It's no longer scary. Right. It's no longer <laughs> as scary. Uh, so your idea then is, you know, this is a thing in church music, actually, that really bothers me because it's this contrived way of people come to church and music is used to either raise or lower our emotions. It's almost in a way we're manipulated by that music, um, if you think about it in one sense. So, And that is what happens in movies. Music is used to drive the emotional stream. But are you saying that you pick the music in situ, you know, it's in the time of the story that you're telling yes. where it belongs so that it's just a bed that the story lies on. That's right. From the beginning. But I, I would take exception with the church thing. If it's done authentically, if it's organic, then that's exactly the same thing. Everybody well, knows that music is the most powerful and the quickest art form, like two notes. And you, you know, true. you got me. Right. And so yeah. maybe it's just a closer walk with thee or the doxology or whatever it might be in whatever faith you have. These are things that they're chord progressions. You don't have to say anything. That's what it is. You do want that congregation with you. Right. And so, yeah, yeah, no, music is just you just have to understand it. And we're also at the same time trying to energetically film an old photograph, treating it like the feature filmmaker yeah. you want to be with a master shot, a, a long shot, a medium, a close, a tilt, a pan, a reveal, inserts of details. And you're not just looking at it. You're listening to it. Are, are you know, are the troops tramping? Are the are the cannon firing? Is the bat cracking? Is the crowd cheering? These are all the things you want to animate. And so our sound effects are as some, I mean, I think in just the battle of Gettysburg, and this was, you know, 33 years ago, we had 160 tracks of, uh, of like, Dubber, I mean, we had like, these were analog tracks going for the battle of, of Gettysburg. And, and for the, say, the Tet Offensive, and I, I'm sorry to use bring up battles, but they're mostly very complex things in which you have shots going off distantly and shots nearby. And so war, war tests your auditory capacities and your sound editing um, extremely. Now working on a history of the American Revolution, same thing is happening. Is that musket firing next to you? Is it firing a mile away? Is it cannon? Is it mortar? Is it, you know, what's the clash of bayonets? What's the sounds of this, you know, the horses? What's so amazing to me um, is that fact. I'm so glad you brought it up because if you watch my movie, The Girl Who Wore Freedom, you will see your fingerprints all over it. And one of the very first things that you may notice is the sound effects underneath the archival photos. Because for me, that has always brought that to life oh, yeah. in a remarkable way. In the American Buffalo, what, there was a moment where you see this buffalo kind of, it's a still image of a buffalo running, but you have the hooves, yeah. which you've already heard earlier with the buffalo running, but now you see the picture and it just makes it come alive it in your mind. Makes, like that, you have to trust that that old photograph was an arrested moment of something that had a past and a future. So that buffalo is making noise. That car is going through the, the, the scene that cannon will or has fired. And so all of these things, you, you help to wake the dead, to make it come alive in, in, in a new way. That's a hugely important part uh, and of many, many parts, not just a third person narration, which, you know, we call voice of God, which we love. And we don't, you know, we, we understand some people don't like that and don't use it. That's absolutely fine. We do in most of the films we've made, a few we haven't. Um, and then first person voices that are letters and journals and diaries <sighs> and they newspaper accounts and they just give you 
uh, a different complement. And if you get some of the best actors, which in the world, which I've been able to do, like Meryl Streep or Julie Harris or Tom Hanks or you know whatever, this film, Jeff- it, it's just it's just amazing. Jeff Daniels is in this. Um, you know, uh, Paul Giamatti is in mm-hmm. it. There, there, there are lots of really wonderful actors who read, and we work with them intimately uh, and get incredibly fine performances out of them. It's, it's remarkable. And again, the, uh, the, it's so impactful that when I thought about making this documentary, I truly was going to make it in your footprint. Like my goal was to make a Ken Burns documentary now because I didn't have money because I didn't have time. And because I am not you, uh, it didn't end up becoming that at all, which is wonderful. Wonderful. Cause there's no, <laughs> there's no copyright on technique. There's no copyright on on the stuff that we use. There's no copyright even on style. But but in order for something to be authentic, it has to be you. You can. Right. I, I I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I remember I saw the film about Gertrude Stein in the early '70s by Perry Miller Adato. She was a, a late uh, a wonderful filmmaker, and uh, they had first person voices. But they filmed the actors reading them on stage, and at one point they cut away to a photograph, and I went. I don't need to see the actors on stage. I just need to see them, hear them over the phone. So yeah. we go in wow. and record people with that. And I've told that to Perry when she was alive a million, million times about how much, you know, I was, I was riffing off what she was doing uh, <laughs> and trying to use live cinematography in from other films and things like that. So we all, we all stand on people and, and that's what it is. It's all, it's all, it's all a conversation with other people, not just with the audience, but with other filmmakers who are who are working yeah. on things. It's it's just great. Well, you know, I wanted so much to stand on your shoulders that I contacted Peter Coyote because he is such a powerful, you know, talk about the voice of God. Like, oh man, I wanted him to tell my story. And of course, I ran out of money and I ran out of time. And I'm a voice actor. And so I just laid down the scratch track. Yep. But it ended up working and yeah. it was part of, you know, this personal narrative that the film ended up being. But what is always so remarkable to me is this mix of sound. Because I'm a voice actor, I am always attuned to the sound, the quality of it and what people are doing and how it undergirds what's going on and how if it's bad, the film could be beautiful visually. And but it sucks. It's yeah. Up, yeah. <laughs> and so what well, I, I'm, I'm the scratch narrator too. And there's always this discussion at, at when we're about 95% of the way through, you know, or at least there used to be. And now I just don't let it even take place where, well, <laughs> we think you should say as a narrator, yeah. nope. And so don't <laughs> tell Peter because we, he, he knows that I'm the scratch narrator and he's always one or two takes and, you know, he's just. Oh, I- Again, he's he's just remarkable. Dear, dear friend. But when, <laughs> when we're on take three or four, he'll say, how, what, how do you hear the music? He uses the word music. He says, oh, wow. what's, mm-hmm. what's your music? Meaning how did I read it and why? And I'm obviously for some meaning reason, I'm not there. And it's not because wow. he's gone up at the end of a phrase, which I, he teases me and I tease him about. I'd rather have things at each thing pitched slightly down. Um, but I've got some other emphasis on a word or some way in which you yeah. related it. And so he'll go, Oh yeah, I get it. And then he'll That's visit beautiful. you. Not, not wow. just the way I want it, the way I read it, but with his pipes. Yeah, wow. I, it, it is. And it's not just Peter Coyote, the other voices that you have, some of them are famous. Others of them are ones we've never heard yep. of yep. In, in the American Buffalo. It's people that you discovered along the way and you think they should be able to read this letter. I mean, it was beautiful. And I'm hurrying now because I promised you we'd get you out of here on time and we only have five more minutes. Um, I would give anything for you to come back because I feel like we do have more this to unpack. Fun. Yeah, This is fun. I'd love to. Yeah. It, it, it's just beautiful. And I'm learning so much by this. So I really extend this invitation for you to come back Thank you, um, right great. now. What I'd like to do is we had to do this segment called DocuView Deja Vu. Docu-view so Deja welcome to our segment DocuView Deja Vu with Ken Burns. And I'm going <laughs> to let you go first because we asked you to bring a documentary that you recommend. And I cannot wait to hear what it is. Well, you know, it was really hard. I heard that sort of at the last moment. I went, how could I recommend a documentary? Because the form is so wide. And I remember in 1985, which is 
an age ago, Vincent Camby writing in the Times saying, how could you use the term documentary when there's Streetwise, which was almost a feature film, right? Mm-hmm. It was documentary. There was Ross McElwee's wonderful Sherman's Mark, which was his honorable tradition of self-referential films. Errol Morris had Thin Blue Line. I had a film on Huey Long that came out. Fred yeah. Weissman brought out something, you know, pure cinema verite, and that didn't even, and now it's just exploded more. So what do you take? Do you take the favorite, you know, uh, Fred Wiseman film, you know, Titicate Follies that he made with John Marshall as the lead filmmaker on that? Do you take more recent thing that he's done? How about Errol? Do you okay. stay with Thin Blue Line? I'm going to love- give you the I'm going to give you the answer. (laughs) We are trying to introduce our audience to documentaries and it doesn't matter what kind we want them. Let me take, let me take a really old one and a brand new one. Okay, great. Perfect. Both of which I think most people 99.99 will not have heard of. The first one is by a British BBC guy named John Grierson who made a film called night mail, which is how the mail all black and white, all at night, how the mail gets from London to Edinburgh or Edinburgh to London. I can't remember the direction. Uh, it's 20 minutes long. I'm sure you can find it. It's so beautiful and so lovely. And it just, I, I saw it my first year at Hampshire College as, and I just went, this is like a perfect film. It's so beautiful. It's amazing. I have been mentoring a lot of people. And recently uh, uh, a woman named Kira Ackerman finished a film called The Hollow Tree. And it follows three women, young women in Louisiana, trying to come to terms with climate change and the changing dynamics of the Mississippi and the other rivers, the Atchafalaya and the basin there and the Army Corps of Engineer. And coming to terms, they're all very different in their origins. One is Native American, you know, one is African American, one is... Um, uh, white American, but there's much more dimension to it. And this lovely, lovely film that I've had the privilege of sort of being, seeing every six months and giving my notes for what they're worth, um, is a lovely thing called The Hollow Tree. So I'd go from Night Mail by John Gerson, uh, to Kira Ackerman's Hollow Tree. Beautiful. That's what I was hoping for. Thank you. All right. I'm going to give you mine. Um, mine is the Roosevelt's by Ken Burns, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, because I don't think it's one that a lot of people watch. People do know the Vietnam War and they know the war and they know um, so many of your things that are famous. The Roosevelt's is famous, but it's just not as watched by many people. So I loved this. It's a series. It's not just a documentary. Uh, the last time I watched it, it was on Netflix. I'm not sure where it is right now. But what I love about it is you take these two relatives that live in two completely different worlds who um, unbelievably shaped our history. Completely. And you, you show their different lives, but how they came together to give us who we are today. Yeah. Uh, again, the voiceovers and the sound effects and the music and um, the unbelievable archival, which is in every one of your movies, which I'm just in trying to do this myself. I'm in awe of, I mean, every time you show an American Indian and the American Buffalo, they are just the most beautiful people. And I'm like, how did you find these? So it's true in the Roosevelt's, but it's true in every other one that all of those pieces come together to make this magnificent whole to educate our brains. Um, and what I love about your films is it gives us a window through which we can see our past as a country and as individuals, but it also holds up a mirror so that we can see hope of our better selves that hopefully we can reach to. And yeah, well, that's very nice. I, I'm very particular to that film. My my principal collaborator, Jeffrey Ward, the writer uh, himself, contracted polio when he was a young boy, and so his empathy with Franklin Roosevelt and uh, his two wonderful books about him. But it really helps to have Paul Giamatti reading Theodore Roosevelt and Ed Herman, the late Ed Herman reading Franklin and a little known actor who I urge everyone to sort of follow named Meryl Streep doing Eleanor. (laughs) She was, she was great. It was the only time Jeff has ever come to a recording session is to hear what, um, Uh, how Meryl would read Eleanor. And I, I've never seen him cry. It had tears in his eyes. And then when we showed it to the, the, the academic consultants, they were like going like, where did they get her voice reading that letter? Like, <laughs> I didn't know that she read that. And then all of a sudden they realized, oh, that's Meryl. So you don't take them because they're celebrities. You take no. them because they're good because yeah, they're the good, and they get lost. And you, you suddenly go, oh, that is Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes. Wow. Yes. And 
I love how you unpack Eleanor's complicated life. I mean, you dive into things that I, I know history, a lot of history, and I was blown away. I didn't know a lot of her history. So Yeah, so she's, I mean, we thought that when Franklin dies in April of 45, that we're going to have to be heading for the exits fairly soon. But uh-uh, she takes no, over the film. And she, she in some way, I mean, she is right on absolutely every issue in the way her her uncle, um, Theodore, and her husband, who were, they were all fifth cousins, um, uh, weren't. Uh, but she was right on everything but prohibition. Her father died a hopeless alcoholic, so we can give her a pass on prohibition <laughs> that the regulation of, of uh, alcohol might be a good thing. It wasn't. Um, and we've got another film on that. But um, after <laughs> that, that is coming up. <laughs> after that, she's right on everything. Yeah. Well, we are a little bit over time. I'm so sorry. I wanted so much to get you out. Yes, Jason. I, I'm just going to sneak in my document deja vu. Yes, please. Everyone, please go watch The American Buffalo. Um, Ken, at, th at this point, this episode will release after it's been on PBS. So where can people watch it right So now? it would be streaming at pbs.org or on the PBS app, and then it'll eventually migrate to their passport, which is their sort of uh, next level donor thing, and will end up on a Netflix or a Hulu or whatever, wherever it goes. And yeah. also, for those of you interested in a there there, um, there are DVDs and, and Blu-rays being released in like, I think November 1st. Yeah. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Amazon has the ability to allow you to buy, um, a, a PBS sort of add on yes. uh, where I, I watch the national parks that way, which is another one I would recommend, even though it's one of your older ones, uh, it's still great. So anyway, yes. It, thank you, Jason, for bringing that up. Uh, it is just an incredible honor. I, I can't even tell you, and I do hope you will come back. I will. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Jason, take us, take us out, Jason. So thankful to have had you here, Ken. Uh, and uh, thank all of you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell, and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody. <laughs>